Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. On this episode, Legacy Trunk with Neil Young, Joe Walsh, Bonnie Ray, and more. Chad Cromwell. And now, Rich Redman. What's up, Rock and Rollers? Yep, it's that time. Another exciting episode of the Rich Redmond Show coming to you from two cities. My guest today, Music City USA, my sidekick cohort, muse, co-producer, Jim McCarthy, JimMcCarthyVoiceOvers.com. Also from Music City, I'm in sunny Los Angeles today. And uh, Jim, how you been, man, since I saw you last uh, 15 minutes ago? <laughs> Doing very well. <laughs> Well, listen, get the sound whatever, effects at the ready. Dude, whatever, so, you, whatever things you did, settings you did on your box to get those sound effects to work, they are great. The threshold, I love playing the, with the settings on my box. Yeah, I, I knew you would go there. See why I keep them around? So, Jim, let's get right into this today. This guy really needs no introduction, but for the folks in the audience that might not be drummers, drummers know who this guy is. And he's, yeah, I mean, this we're talking, this is like... This is like heavy, man. This is velvet rope shit. Um, longtime drummer, folks like Neil Young, Mark Knopfler, Joe Walsh, Crosby, Stills, and Nash. Now, he's toured with all these people. He's recorded with all these people. And then you can hear him with all the usual crew of characters, the Chesneys, the Mirandas, the Blakes, the Traces, hailing from originally from Paducah, Kentucky, our friend Chad Cromwell. How are you, buddy? I'm very well, thank you. Very well. Thanks for having me on board today. Yeah, man. It's, well, it's so funny. Um, you can remind me when you moved to Nashville. It was several times that you've lived in Nashville over mm -hmm. the years. Um, but I moved to Nashville in 1997, and our drums are parked over at the same place, Drum Paradise. And everyone hears about this. It's like an urban legend of this guy, Chad Cromwell, that's one of the like, most working drummers in Nashville, but I never get to run into you. You know what I mean? We're always sitting behind a set of drums. And so it's so long overdue. And there was one year that I did this like two part spread for Rhythm Magazine on the drummers of Nashville. You're so busy, you couldn't even make the, the session, man. Well, I got lucky. I guess I had a lucky week that week. I don't know. Well, <laughs> well man, you've been at this for so long. I mean, if we go way back, yeah. Born in Paducah, but mm -hmm. then you really consider yourself a, a Memphian. Exactly, yeah. Uh, by way of Clarksdale, Mississippi, yeah. Wow, okay. And yeah. then you've that, lived in that, London, you've lived that, in Los Angeles, you've lived in yeah. Nashville, you've lived mm -hmm. on airplanes. Yeah, oh, yeah, still do. <laughs> and, tour, and tour buses. Well, well that's mm -hmm. like what I really, really like about you is, is I don't know if you, you know, thought about it as a business model. It was certainly for me, it was like, look at in Nashville, you can very much well be very, very segregated. I'm a songwriter. I'm a producer. I'm a touring musician. I'm a, I'm a studio musician. You have always played on people's records. You have always been willing to jump on the bus to take the music to the people, which I, maybe I stole that from you. Definitely Kenny Aronoff had that same kind of business model. I yeah. love it. I feel like each of those things kind of feeds one another. Mm -hmm. Am I right in saying that? That's you're right. spot on. Yeah, I mean, by my way of thinking, you're spot on. It, it, and it sounds like absolutely what you feel. And and Kenny and, and I'm still, you know, lots of guys, lots of guys. But um, you know, to me, for for the way that I approach music and the way I think about music, uh, one feeds the other. And there's no particular order of priority. It's just that one feeds the other. And so if, if there's, a, there's a, a physical energy that playing live has that you cannot reproduce in a studio, it's not possible. You can, you can access the spirit of that, but, but, the, but the, the thing of being in front of whether it's 50 people at Douglas Corner or 500,000 people at the Detroit Grand Prix or whatever it is, it, there's a, something that happens when you're in front of an audience that elevates your whole psyche. You know, you're, you know, just like all your synopsis are just like banging because you're influenced by eyesight. You're influenced by the way people are physically reacting to what you're doing up there with the, your mates. Uh, 
just the space that you're in, you know, the just all of it. It's just, it influences and informs the way you play. In the studio, you know, we have a whole different set of construction rules, you know. And so we kind of know that we're like in a singular position to go into, okay, here's the song, here's the demo of the song, or, or if it's a demo session, here's the acoustic uh, vocal version of the song, and this is kind of what we want to go for. So our job is to, is to execute that for someone. So it, we're inside of a box that's inside of a box that has a recording, uh, you know, a, a Pro Tools rig set up in it. <laughs> and, you know, our gig is to make sure that song gets documented. So I just think that playing live helps me to bring some energy to a recording session, you know, where, I, where I'll, I'll hopefully try to access that place where I, where I know you understand, where, which is access the place where we're no longer thinking, access the place where it's a spiritual, you know, expression, where it's yes. just like it totally in the moment, totally uh, uh, influenced by – a musical conversation that's happening among the other folks in the room with us and uh, you know, greater, the greater than the sum of our parts, you know, it's thing, whatever you call that, you know? And, and so without the live piece, right. Without the touring, without the getting on the airplanes and the tour buses and the missing home and missing our loved ones, you know, all of that, without all of that, then to me, recording is just, it's like any job, you know, it's like a journeyman craft that we go and we do on a daily basis and we do the best job we can with that. But, um, but if all I see is a pair of headphones and a recording studio and nothing else, I can assure you a guy like me is going to get bored. You know, and if I get bored, then I'm not giving the client or the artist or producer what they need and expect from me. And so the gig is like, okay, it's worth the risk of leaving the, you know, that sort of the security place of, oh, I'm a recording musician and it's a nine to five, or in our case, it's a a 10 a.m. to 9 p.m. kind of thing on a busy day. And, and uh, this is what I do, and I do nothing more Monday through Friday, weekends off. This is kind of sounding like an insurance salesman's gig, <laughs> you know, a, a really good one, but it's still kind of one-dimensional, you know, and, yeah. and so the live thing pulls me completely away from all of that, yeah. and, and it gets me into the unknown space of working for guys like Neil where I have no idea from measure to measure what's getting ready to happen. And there's a, a, a level of consciousness that that produces that is absolutely impossible to duplicate, you know, yeah. uh, studio. It's just not possible. I've done it with Neil. It's not the same thing. But – I, I just rely on it. It's lifeblood to me. But yeah. so is the studio, you know? It's like, yeah, no. it's a duality. It's like, I got to have both. You yeah, know? to me, they're completely different and completely the same. And I know a lot of people overthink it. I'm like, look at we're in service of the music. We're making the producer, the artist, the songwriter, the label. We're working for them. It's yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. You get on the road, it's the same thing, getting into the mindset of, I mean, I've been working with the same guy for 21 years, which is yeah, which is uh, rarefied air, as you know, as far as like, because yeah. the music business is the wild, wild west. Mm -hmm. um, and so there isn't a day goes by that, that I, I don't appreciate that. Whether it's in the studio or on the road, I know what that expectation is from that entire camp. Know the song, show up, bring the energy, smile, you know, heads up, lay down the song, stay out of the way. We know what to do. And it's just a matter of getting up there every day and, and executing with a smile on our face. That's right. That, that's right. And, and you're one of the best at that. I mean, I, 
I've seen you play, and, and you've got a thing about you that that's it's exciting to watch, you know. And, oh, and thank you. It's really, really cool. And what you've done with Jason, I think, is is just really, really – that's a remarkable thing in our world, of, in the country world, where you guys have taken, you know, uh, you've taken what I think – I consider it to be the concepts of what a rock and roll band is yeah. all about, which is you're a band, you know, and uh, and Michael has done such a great thing. Yes. This, uh, by keeping you guys together as a as a unit, and it sounds like it, you know, it just oh. it, it sounds like it. You should be very proud of that. Well, thank it, you so see, much. That, that sounds the, like you can even hear the the trademarks on other artists' records that they play on. Sure, you know. Absolutely. Well, uh, man, I you know, hey, I do I do appreciate. Like I said, that there's so much in this industry that comes down to gratitude and humility. And, uh, you know, trying not to uh, let moss grow on the log, you know, trying to stay relevant, you know, take picking those ripe grapes and turning them into, you know, fine wine. And you're no stranger to this. I mean, you are a band guy. You know how to yeah. operate in a band and read the room. You're the, you're the conductor. You're a psychologist. You're giving direction. You're taking direction. So it starts for you in Memphis. You're listening to guys like Al Jackson, Ringo, Buddy Rich. Self-taught? Did you take lessons? Self-taught. That's incredible. Self -taught. Yeah, I never, I never took, well, I, I, actually, I shouldn't say never. Uh, when I was around, I don't know, 20 or so, I started playing drums when I was eight. But I did it just purely because, you know, the kid down the street got Christmas presents for he and his brother from Sears. And one of them got the little, the uh, silver tone guitar with the amp built into the case. Yep. And then. The other guy got a red sparkle set of Sears drums. I, I'm not sure who made them, but, you know, I went down there to see what Santa Claus brought him when I was eight. <laughs> I thought Santa brought it to him. Now, and, did you and, instinctively know what to do when you yeah, got on the kit? That's the weird thing. It's like, it's like when I got there, I went straight to the drum set. I sat down behind the drum set, and I just started playing a beat. Not sophisticated, but... I started just playing a beat and it felt like completely comfortable. You know, it was like, it didn't feel foreign to me at all. And I grew up, my mom was a classical pianist and, and was a, a teacher for many, many years, organist. Uh, she was also uh, really great at pipe organ. So she played in churches, you know, so I grew up underneath a baby grand piano. She just from the time I was a baby. Wow. But piano made no sense to me ever. It just, I just didn't want to go there. I found these drums. Awesome. But the, but even then the drums weren't, I never really viewed them as anything other than something fun to do. I wanted to be a baseball player. That's all, you know? Oh, wow. So I, I was really never aspirational about the drums until I was about 14 15 somewhere right around in there i got i got turned on to it you know and it's like wow okay this is more than just you know yeah. something past the time until the next baseball game so the so, ed sullivan show 1964 was that a game changer for you because you were only like yeah. seven or eight years old maybe and in front of the tv screen yeah yeah absolutely man seeing those black oyster ludwig sitting up there yep it, yeah. You know, it was the way that Ringo laid into that kit was Ringo, you know, and it was like I could see the little band stand moving and I could see him putting every ounce of his energy into that kit. And absolutely, it was a game changer, a game changer without question. Oh, he, pre he presented last night on the Grammys, and even my girlfriend was kind of like making out. I said, that dude is 80 years old. And she goes, he looks 55 years old. You know, yeah. I, so you've worked with uh, McCartney. I've seen video yeah. where he jumped on stage. Have you worked yeah. with Ringo yet? I've never worked with him. My wife does, though. She's, uh, she sings on all of his stuff. Oh, is your wife's a session singer? She's a badass session singer. Her name wow. is Whitney. 
like a windy day. Wendy Wagner, look her up. It's frightening. <laughs> frightening. Now, how did you kids meet? With Joe Walsh. Ah, uh, was she she one of the chick singers on the on the stage? She's one of the chick singers in the band. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Changed my life, man. So were you married before? Is this number two? Yeah, I was married before. I was married for 25 years. I was in a 31-year relationship. Wow. The Rich Redmond Show will be right back. Those who are self-employed, especially musicians, think homeownership is unattainable. For Bruce Klein, it took seven years to purchase his first home as a self-employed working musician. But once he did, man, was it satisfying. So he decided he wanted to help other musicians and creatives gain that same satisfaction. Bruce earned his lending license and is now helping people avoid the mistakes he made on his seven-year journey. If you're a self-employed musician, he can help. Go to MusiciansMortgage.com, powered by Movement Mortgage. Bruce Klein, NMLS, number 1465948. Movement Mortgage supports equal housing opportunity. NMLS, number 39179. NMLS, consumeraccess.org. Henry Ford once said that if you need a machine and don't buy it, then you will ultimately find that you have paid for it and don't have it. Nothing could be truer about energy-efficient LED lighting in your business. At Big Dot Lighting, we can show you how a portion of your savings from a commercial LED lighting upgrade will be paid for in hardly any time at all. Until then, you're paying for them anyway. Book a no-cost lighting energy assessment with Big Dot Lighting. At least 30% of your utility bill is waiting to be saved. Go to BigDotLighting.com. Are you a drummer looking to expand your drumming vocabulary or take your career to the next level? You can connect with me for one-on-one -on -one virtual lessons and consultations that are now 30% off. I cover topics like styles, reading music, the Nashville number system, charting, music business 101, and career guidance. Simply send me an email at booking at richredmond.com to schedule. And for more information on all of my products and services, visit richredmond.com. This is the Rich Redman Show. We talk. I usually would get into that just a little bit on the show, like just because just tipping our hat to the idea that the, you know the creative arts and the the travel and the lack of normal schedules is not for the faint of heart. You know, it's it's definitely no. something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a it's what we do is uh, is very particularly um, taxing for yeah. for traditional family life. It's a really, really hard thing to do. And, and uh, you know, um, sadly, you know, I, I, my kids had to go through some tough years because of all of the, the stresses that a career can place on, on, on a family life. And also just, you know, the, the way that we as humans evolve, sometimes we evolve in a very different direction. Yeah. And that's happen you know and and it was uh it just was what it was you know it, it came to an end but you know as things do uh i'm a real believer in in uh uh in finding destiny you know and sometimes getting to that can kick your ass a million different ways before you actually realize that that what the journey that you're on is exactly the one you're supposed to be on Th you know through the refinement phase of that it's very uncomfortable and yeah. uh you know i i actually you know i feel a lot of gratitude uh to find myself where i am at this this stage of my life uh creatively you know, uh, uh, in, in all ways, musically, in all ways, romantically, in all ways, uh, as a father, in all ways. I'm, I'm a better dad now than I've ever been. Mm. My kids are grown. You know mm. what I mean? It's well, like what, it, what they what they get into. You got any musicians? I got two natural born musicians that watch their dad and want no part of being in the music business. You know, <laughs> it's too hard. They don't yeah. want to. They, they don't want to do it. They, that's kind of that's kind of good because you have to have it. It's like nothing else is going to be an option. Yeah, you know that. You, you know, gotta it, have that. It's the it's 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 what is it? Eddie Izzard. Do you know who that is? Uh, is oh yeah. Great? Yeah. Death or cake? Have you ever seen his uh, stand up routine? Eddie Izzard. <laughs> yeah, great great British comedian. He does yeah. a great bit, and he and he's he's like in a really really horribly bad drag outfit standing on stage 
stand-up comic, comedy. And he does this whole history of the world stand-up bit. That's one of the funniest things I have ever seen in my life. And, uh, and there's this whole this thing he does about <laughs> it's an English thing, but uh, you know, it's like, okay, well, what are, what are my options here? Death or cake? Which do you prefer? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's only one choice here, you know, and that, and that's, I see, you know, what we do uh, as drummers in this business, uh, y- you have to, you have to, you have to kind of be a little crazy and a little bit overly determined and self-confident to do this because y- y- there's no, there's no, okay, I'll do this job over here and then I'm going to be a session guy or I'm going to do, I'm going to be a touring guy, but I'm not going to do the, that grunt stuff where there's no money in it. I'm only going to do the big tours. I only want yeah. that, you know, well, guess how you get there, pal. The grunt you know, stuff. You climb into the back of the van with the rest of us. And the, yeah, and you and you did that. And you know, the first you first yeah. got on my radar, and this might bring back some memories for you, but there was a Radney Foster record called See What You Want to See, oh, yeah. 1998. And yeah. around the same time, um, well, 1999, I got the touring job with Pam Tillis. And this was the first time I had someone twisting off my water bottle and setting up my drums and carrying... Fans on one, Rich, or fans on three? It was, like, amazing. It was like, I can't, this is awesome. And yeah. you played on the record, Thunder and Roses. So you were, like, on my radar. You're playing on this Radney Foster record. It was just, it was very eye-opening because it was, like, a master class in how you play for a singer-songwriter. The drum so, so, tones were so open. Like, I don't think there was a moon gel in sight. It was no. just, you know what I mean? It was, it was gorgeous. And... There was, I learned about, I was like, check out this drummer. He doesn't play a crash cymbal where you want to hear one. And he plays a crash cymbal where you would never expect one. And then maybe out of the blue, there's just some floor tom hit on the Anna 4. Like all incredibly musical stuff, but just different from what I was hearing with Eddie and Lonnie and, you know, right. with the folks I was hearing um, mm-hmm. on Music Row. Yeah. So that's where you first got on my radar. Mm-hmm. Yeah, oh, man. man. You know, uh, uh, the first guy to hire me in Nashville, well, actually, that's not entirely true because Nashville is divided into two seasons for me before before I actually was living here, you know. So I was coming up here in the early 80s doing contemporary Christian projects, you know, and Mm -hmm. and. Got to know like guys like Jerry McPherson and Mike Brigner Dello, and you know, the list just goes on and on and on. All these great players, you know, in that genre. And uh, uh, but I never could quite like get my head around, I don't think I want to go to Nashville just to play on contemporary Christian records. That's not really, nah, I don't think so. And so Mike Brigner Dello gets up here. And uh, has his apartment, gets a, a codephone plugged in. That's how far back this goes. And and uh, that's the answering and, machine. The answer machine. And he, you know, and I, and he starts. He's kind of coaching me a little bit gradually, year by year. On here's how you do this. You know, if you want to get up here and get into the country scene, here's how you do this. Because Mike started transitioning out of the contemporary Christian world into the country thing, you know? So I followed him and then Michael Rhodes was probably the one who really, that was the last straw. Michael and I really play well together. And on a session in Memphis, he just said, you got to do this, dude. You know? Yeah. It's three hours down the road, pack your stuff. Yeah. Let's go. What are you waiting for? So, okay. Yeah, I guess you're right. So, so I came up. So, Anyway, fast forward, uh, my first, like, real, like, what I consider to be, okay, I live in Nashville. I really am going to do this session thing. I'm committed to this. Was uh, a Joan Baez record that Wally Wilson and Kenny Greenberg produced. Wow. And so I go to the session, and Kenny actually hired me for, like, what he told me anyway. He said, man... He said, 
the way you played the eighth, your eighth notes on Rockin' in the Free World, I really, really like the way you do that. And so I want you to play on this record. And then when he tells me it's a Joan Baez record, I'm thinking, wait a second. You like the way my eighth notes sound on Rockin' in the Free World, so you want me to play on a Joan Baez record? <laughs> and we, it was really funny to me. And I thought, okay, I'll do it. I'll do it. I'm like, Thank you. So uh, Treasure Island Studio is where we did it. Wow. And, and, uh, and I walk in the door, and the bass player that was hired for the gig was Willie Weeks. Wow. You know, and I walk in the door, and it's like, hey, man, I'm Willie. And I'm just going, oh, my God. This is it, – it was very exciting, you know. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> I mean, because, because really, when you think about it, and we were talking about a British comedian, but you lived in London. I mean, you were in high school. You graduated. As soon as you graduate, you get a gig with a signed act. You're living in London, right? Yeah. You're, and yeah. then for a while, you're going back and forth between Nashville and Los Angeles, just go, mm -hmm. going where the opportunities are. I mean, I, yeah. I would say, like, ever since you were a senior in high school, you, you haven't missed a meal. You've been playing the drums professionally. That's crap. <laughs> yeah, I haven't stopped, man. I've, you know, in one way or another, I've managed to keep my feet moving forward, you know. And, and uh, the London thing was a trip because it literally was two weeks after I graduated from high school. That's and, amazing. Yeah, and I got this gig uh, largely because the, the two pr other principals in the band – were originally from Memphis, living in London. Yeah. One of the guys was um, uh, Robert Johnson, was uh, the guitar player in John Entwistle's side band called Ox. Oh, yeah. And then, uh, and then David Cochran, the bass player, was playing for uh, an artist called Chris Spadding, who was kind of a, a hot rod guitar guy over there. And then he, and then he, uh, Roy Harper came after that. Anyway, these guys were pretty well established over there, you know, as like Southern boys from the U S you know, and, right. and in the seventies that had a, uh, that had a little bit of uh, juice on it, you know, to be from Memphis. So uh, I got this gig. I jammed with David when he had come home to visit his family on a break, a holiday break. And the next thing I know, it's like, Come on, man. Let's go. Can you can you move to London? I went, yeah. And, <laughs> and so anyway, we, we I get over there and we go uh, we go straight into the studio uh, to the studio called Mayfair and we make an album in three days. Wow. It's like kind of power punk trio stuff, you know. And uh, it was really fun and really good. And uh, Elton John's startup label called Rocket Records uh, was they were going to sign us. And uh, the first two signings of that label were us and Grace Jones. Yeah. And, wow. uh, and uh, you know, the disco gal, the James Bond. Yeah. And yes. so uh, anyway, uh, I, I won't bore you with all the details, but – Anyway, I went from in, in a space of six months or whatever it was to I'm living in London. We're living in this beautiful brownstone. I think I'm about to become a rock star, and I'm pretty sure there's some big checks coming, and uh, it, we're going to go on tour with Elton John, blah, 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 blah. It's, this is – I can't believe it. We were taken out to the Marshall Guitar Factory in Bletchley, mm -hmm. and the guitar player and baseball, they ordered – Tons of gear, which in the mid seventies was very desirable stuff to have. Yeah, and it all fell apart, just yeah. like in the business. The stories it was like it was just ridiculous, you know. But it was yeah. a great vacation, and it started me on my path. And you know, London's yeah. always kind of back home to me. I was. Yeah, I mean, you know, I it, it makes me kind of think when I'm doing a deep dive for our guests and kind of just getting a feel of the whole story. It seems like it really came down to you. Obviously you have this incredible ability. You have this it factor playing the drums. 
people are attracted to your your talent and also probably your personality and your hang and all that kind of stuff that people like to talk about. But it just seemed like one relationship after another led. I mean, you're working with Joe Walsh where you're like 30 years old, right? And that, how did that happen? Wasn't that a... That was 86 that I met and started working with Joe. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, uh, that was, I was still living in Memphis at the time. I got to Nashville in 90. So uh, like officially in Nashville in, in 1990. In 86, I met Joe in Memphis. And uh, uh, we, we met at a studio uh, that I worked at fairly frequently. And then uh, one thing led to the next. Uh, a few very late night hangs, uh, not unlike what you would expect with Keith Richards. You know, and uh, really, really fun and really kind of scary all at the same time, you know. And then the next thing I know, he just says, he calls me and he goes, hey, man, you want to uh, you want to come do a gig? And I went, yeah, what like what's going on? And he goes, well, uh, the first thing I need you to do, I need you to come to Austin. I think it was. No, it was Dallas. I need you to come to Dallas, hang, because we're doing, me and Rick, the bass player, we're doing this guest DJ thing in Austin for a week. So why don't you come down here for the week? And when we're not working on the radio station doing the show, we'll get together and we'll, we'll rehearse every day, you know, work, work the stuff up. <laughs> okay, this is going to be awesome. So I fly down there. They they put me up. You know, I'm in the hotel with them. First day, you know, first day goes by. I get a call. It's like we can't we can't get together today. Some some things have come up, and uh, so we'll we'll just catch up tomorrow. We'll make up for lost time tomorrow. The next day comes. I hang out with them a bit uh, uh, after the first day. Later that night, the next day comes more excuses about why we can't get together and rehearse, right? And where's Joe? I don't know where Joe is, but he's not rehearsing. So day after day, and of course, you know, the pressure's rising with me every day. That, right. that, all right, because I've got a week to be prepared for my first gig with Joe. Yeah. Uh, long story short, I never did get to rehearse with Joe. All I got to do with Joe was party with him late at night. And then we had to get on a plane and fly to Los Angeles early in the morning. We flew to LA, got off the plane, got in a limousine, and then we drove to uh, 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 Irvine. Irvine. Irvine, yeah. We drove to Irvine to a KLOS, some big thing, uh, celebration, annual celebration, that's hosted by Gino Michelini, who was a big rock and roll DJ for KLOS for years and years and years. Good, he was good buddy for, for quite a few years. And uh, I'm just going, this is, this is horrible. This is just the worst thing it could have ever. It's like my first, like, sure enough, like, gig big gig this is going to burn up in flames you know never gotten a fair shot at it so we get to the gig you know and by the time it was due to go on stage i'm shitting my pants you know it's just like <laughs> i can't believe this is happening you know and i finally just i just kind of let go of it and i just went you know what there's nothing i can do now i'm just gonna go i'm just gonna go for it I, I've heard these songs through the years. I kind of know them. I don't know beginnings and endings, but I, right, here we go. And we went out there and we had an absolute ball. Nice. As, played as a trio, which is my favorite way to play with Joe, uh, except for when I met my wife. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but, uh, well, we how does Joe Vitale absolutely. fit into all this? Well, that I'll, I'll tell you. Uh, first of all, well, let me finish this. Okay. We brain racks, man. We had some doozies, you know, but we had fun, and it was total rock and roll, and that was 
anyway, that was the beginning of what is now almost a 30 year relationship with Joe. Awesome. Awesome. So, so, uh, where Joe, where Joe Bob fits into this. Joe is, Bob. Yeah. Well, that's, we all, call, we, we all lovingly call him Joe Bob. Nice. And, and uh, where that he fits in is he was uh, at that time working a lot with CSN. Oh, yeah. He was doing other projects and Joe was in some fairly controversial years of his uh, hiatus from the Eagles. And it, they were tough, you know, it was some tough times for Joe and all uh, and sort of everyone in his periphery. Uh, it was tough, but, uh, so Joe was, he was off doing his thing with CSN and, uh, it was, they just, they were just not working together for a minute, yeah. how, which is how I got in there. And, uh, we eventually got together. I can't remember exactly when right around 89 or 90, somewhere around in there, we got together, uh, in the studio. We went in the studio with Joe. Uh, Bill Simzik comes back into the picture to produce it. Joe Bob comes into the picture to play keyboards and some drums on the record. And uh, we end up in Chattanooga on Lookout Mountain. There was a studio up there. And uh, we made the Ordinary Average Guy record up there. Nice. Nice. Yeah. And, and that's how I got to know Joe Bob. And then subsequent to that and supporting that record, we went on a double bill tour with the Doobie Brothers. Two bands, two drummers in each band, and it was a circus. We had a blast. Wow. We, really, we had a lot of fun together. Got to know those guys really well. and It was good times. Good times. We're in proximity to Rock City, were you? Huh? Where in proximity to Rock City were you? Well, you know, if there's a little, do you know the, do you know Chattanooga pretty well? I when you mentioned Lookout Mountain, we've been there several times camping, and it's a, uh, it's, it's a hard to miss mountain. It's yeah, you know, ginormous. It's, yeah, it's huge. Well, if you go up, uh, up to the to Lookout Mountain, whatever that area is called, yeah. there's a little village up there. And there's a, like a grocery store and a couple of little, I don't know, sewing sh a sewing shop and a just really super quiet bedroom kind of community up there. And, and some folks live up there. And uh, that's where the studio was. You know, Is it, was it on the Georgia side or Tennessee? Tennessee. Yeah. Tennessee side. Yeah. 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 Now, Jim, it's, when it's, did... <laughs> Yeah. I was going to say, Jim, you, I remember you telling me the story of like when you were moving to Nashville from Vegas because you were doing radio in Vegas and you were, you were trying to like pop your cherry a little bit on listening to, you know, modern country music. What were the first acts that you were listening to? Because you might have been listening to Chad a good 10 years ago, 15 years ago. We were listening to, well, 15 years ago, we, I, I'll tell you exactly how it happened. Courtney and I took our last trip together as a, you know, kidless or you know childless. couple childless couple <laughs> um so we went to tampa florida and the notion of us moving to nashville had been the seeds had been planted because we but we wanted to get out of vegas and uh we got to tampa um and just started listening to a local country station there so whatever was on the top 40 playlist in the country of country um you know the the, the power rotation of the time was what we heard. So it was, uh, you know, the Dirks Bentley was brand new. Jason Aldean was brand new. Yeah. Um, a lot of those guys, we heard, uh, uh, Montgomery Gentry and all those guys. I mean, it was just, it was, it was a good time to get into it because I mean, the songs really resonated with us, especially yeah. at that time, you know? Well, sure. Yeah. Well, that's, I mean, to me, that's like, it's like it's Southern rock country, you know? Yep. And uh, those all the bands you mentioned and artists you mentioned were interestingly, I, I think of as very band oriented sounding yep. records. You know, yeah, uh, it uh, was rock, but not. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, it's, exactly. Yeah, because to, really, you know, uh, to hear um, got a lot of leaving left to do. Yeah. With you know that just that four on the floor beat. <laughs> 
<laughs> once a drummer, once a I drummer. Love it. Yeah. And it was like this is this is like playing rush songs for crying. I think that was Steve Brewster on that track. You know, when no. you think about Steve, you think about contemporary Christian music, you know, and he was sure. you know, he was starting to venture into those into those worlds. I mean, when you start looking at this list, you know, Jim, check this out. Dave Stewart, Vince Gill, Amy Grant, Lady A, Diane Crawl, Willie Nelson, Jackson Brown, Boz Skaggs, Wynonna, Trisha Yearwood, Miranda Lambert, Bonnie Ray, Peter. Come on, man. This is the who's who of the music business. You know, you know what I like to I tell I tell students, I say, hey, look at now you're gonna run into celebrities. You're probably gonna end up working for celebrities. Just remember this. They put on their jeans one leg at a time, they poop and they pay taxes. So they're Here's just the normal one, people. Yeah. Here's the one thing though. It's a, it, it, typically around here they will treat you the same way. You know, the, it's just hey man, we're just we're just people. You will every now and then get the one that's got oh. the chip on their shoulder. Oh yeah. Yeah. But they're yeah. not usually at the top of their game. They're usually somewhere in the middle and they're frustrated about be, about being in the middle. Am I right? Maybe yeah. in my experience. Yeah, I, you know. Yeah, I think generally speaking, you are you are right. There's, you know, I'm, I'm here hesitating whether or not to tell this story or not. <laughs> not, not to do with country music at all. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, okay. Here's how I'll do it. Amnesty International, 1990, Santiago, Chile. I was there to work uh, to work for Jackson Brown. Who was appearing for the in as one of the acts in the uh, on the Amnesty International concert? It's a big deal, big and one. yeah, and and so um, the uh, hosts of the of the whole thing were Sting and Peter Gabriel. Okay, they they and uh, Ruben Blades. Those three like hosts of the, of the event. And uh, so there's this breezeway, this old, old, old soccer stadium uh, that where the concert was held. And, and in the breezeway was uh, uh, like this long row of what became a series of dressing rooms, maybe 10 or 15 dressing rooms because there were just act after act after act going on stage. And this went on for like two days, you know. So we're in our, our little dressing room, and we're waiting. We're waiting to go on. And uh, just in this breezeway, there are like all these people coming and going, crew guys, uh press people, bands coming and going, just really crowded breezeway. Long, long, long hallway. All of a sudden, this commotion from way down there starts happening. I mean, it's like, what's going on? It's almost like the parting of the seas, you know, is happening. And But it was happening so far away, I, we couldn't tell what, what it was, what was going on. Well, the parting of the seas continues and gets closer and closer and closer. And when it gets about 25, 30 feet away, we figure out what's going on. And it's Sting, and he's surrounded by probably 10 bruisers with guns and, like, really, like a platoon of security. Wow. He won't talk to anybody, head down, you know, da 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 you know. Like, no communication with anybody. He just blows through the crowd, right? Won't speak to anybody. Now, this is one of the hosts, right? He blows through. We find out a little bit later. He doesn't want to talk to anybody. He just doesn't want to communicate, you know? Whatever. He won't, he won't talk to anybody. Well, about the, the, the sea comes back together as he, after he passes, Life goes back to normal. And then a few minutes later, there's like a, like that. And uh, uh, one of the guys in the band goes to the door and opens the door. There's Peter Gabriel standing there, you know, and he goes, um, hi, I just, uh, my name is Peter Gabriel and I'm one of the hosts here. And I just thought maybe it would be nice if I came by and got to, 
introduce myself to you and see if you guys are comfortable. Is there anything I can do for you? Uh, you know, are you kidding me? So come on in. So he comes on in and he just could not have been a more lovely host, right? Nice. So total polar opposite ways of doing what Jim just described. You know, they're, mm -hmm. occasionally you run into these folks, they don't want to know about you. They don't want, they just don't. They, they, they're in their bubble and they're going to stay in that bubble and nothing's going to interrupt that. And yeah. then there are, your Gabriel that come along, they'll want to make you a sandwich. You know, that actually happened to Bob Glaub and I in, <laughs> um, uh, it was a Stevie Ray Vaughn show at Pine Knob where he died. Okay. Oh, wow. In the helicopter crash. Mm. And we were, uh, we had gotten in a day early with Jackson and we, we didn't have anything to do, you know? And so we got invited to come out to Stevie Ray's show. We came out there and he was pretty newly sober at this yeah. time. And uh, we came to the show and I'm thinking, man, I, you know, I feel a little weird about going to, into his dressing room. I, I, I don't want to do that, you know. And Bobby just said, oh, man, it's okay. We, we know these guys. It's, it's all good. And I went, okay, we'll go in there. We went in there. And it was the same thing as Peter. Stevie's standing there. Hey, man, come on in here. How you doing? Blah, blah, blah. He tried to fix us a sandwich while we were in there. And he was about to go on stage. Yeah. Right? That, yeah, just it, it, his mom trained him right. It was just being hospitable, man. You guys want the cheese on your sandwich or what? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. What it, it just couldn't have been a nicer cat, you know. So, you just in Vegas. You know, I just think I just think we're lucky when we get to work with these amazing cats that are also human beings, really really nice people, you know. Paul McCartney absolutely falls into that category could couldn't be a nicer guy you know just yeah. couldn't and yeah. you know it's so unnecessary if you're at a level of success like that Amen. you have nothing to prove man mm -hmm. yeah. you know and and to just just be nice you know is a is a real welcome thing i see, a, i way more of that than i see the the bad stuff that's and that's great to hear with the amount of people you've worked with. That that is awesome. Now, Jim, um, <clears throat> I gotta say, it's so challenging getting talented people together. It's like herding cats. Jim's gonna be pulled away. He's got a last minute coaching. He's a soccer coach. You got a last minute oh. game here. But so we're gonna stay on. We're gonna talk a little bit. But Jim is gonna ask you a random okay. question of the day. And then oh. we can continue talking about drum nerd stuff. Oh. Question. And we're, new, we're doing the tension bed thing now. You like the tension bed, right? I do, I love yeah. It. <laughs> I'm still okay, old. Chad. What skill do you wish more people took the time to learn? <laughs> what skill? Now, is this a general question of all humanity? It's completely random. Just, uh, yeah. yeah, just in general. <clears throat> Well, I would have to say social skills. I would say so. That's a good one. I'm going like, to give that a Please and thank shot. you. <laughs> yeah, that's a start. <laughs> Dude, is there any problem? Well, and there's so many bad drivers everywhere. It's like, can you at least just use your turn signal? I mean, just as a courtesy here. Well, it kind of plays into what we were just talking about. Social skills, right? Yeah. 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 Common courtesy. Yeah. It goes a long way. Man, that's, I, that's, I, yeah. that's very I'm important really, in the South. You know, I mean, we, you know, it's like I'm from Connecticut, but it's just I've noticed that in the South, it's just you're taught those things at a young age. I know so many people from other parts of uh, unknown uh, out there, wherever. They all say the same thing, how hospitable people are down in this way. You know, just general friendliness, you know. And it is just a, it's a fundamental, like, please and thank you. You know, you just, you be nice to people and, and, you know, no matter what, or just about no matter what. 
And that goes very far because I say it's an expectation, of course, for you to have this amazing, you know, skill set and, you know, exceed expectations and be on time and be able to problem solve with a smile on your face. But just that thing of like, hey, can we have a cup of coffee together? Can you take direction without being offended? All that stuff is so important. It sure is, man. It's super, super important. Uh, You know, I, I just learned very early on. You just, you just got, I don't know. I really, I don't know how to do it any other way than the way I was taught, you know? And uh, I try to apply that. Sometimes I'm not totally successful, but, but I try anyway. Sure. Absolutely. Jim, great question, man. That was. um, I know you got to pop off, Jim. Thank you for your time and talent, buddy. Everybody, Jim McCarthy, voiceovers.com. We love Jim. Tell me to leave now? Well, no, you said you got a hard, you, you got to go coach a, ba- uh, a game. Well, you got four no. minutes exactly. Four minutes. Yeah. And okay. counting. Well, so, so if you pop off, it's no big deal. We're going to keep talking about lugs and die cast hoops and pedal tents. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> Floor times, legs or not? Yeah. yeah. That go. is the question. Legs, legs. Legs. Yeah. Well, you know, what's was, was funny is I, I was doing I was doing some research and I was uh, listening to our buddy Trav from Drum Paradise has a little, nice little drum chats podcast. And it was so cool. He brought up this whole thing about, you know, how Nashville is a live rhythm section town. And it's one of the last places on earth where it's kind of like Stax Records or Motown where you got eight guys on the floor counting off the song, looking at each, each other and the whites of each other's eyes. And whereas Los Angeles has become outside of TV and film, it's such a heavy pop and hip hop culture of the MPC and using in, in the box instruments that it's very rare to have a, a rhythm section on the floor. And you brought up this idea that you, you had this new uh, goal and direction for what Los Angeles has to offer. What is this next season of your life? What are you working on? Well, I mean, there are a couple of several things, but, but largely what I've gotten into is, is film and television composition. Oh, great. And so, and so I have a partner in Los Angeles uh, called, uh, called Amats Plesner. And he's first generation Israeli and super talented composer. And he's done a lot of stuff, I mean, through the years. You know, he's, his, his work has been in a lot of films, you know, not the least of which would be Avatar. And he's, been, he's had some, you know, he, he wasn't the music director of that film, but he made contributions to it and had the pieces of his work that are in it. And uh, he's done all kinds of stuff, you know, big ad campaign stuff. He was like Calvin Klein for years. and. Nice. It's been a lot of that sort of thing. And he's a neighbor that lives just around the corner. And we met uh, uh, at a party at our neighbor's, our next door neighbor's place. And we just started talking. And it was like, yeah, maybe someday, you know, it'd be nice. Maybe we'll do some music together. And, you know, how many times have we said that to new acquaintances? Yeah. And it never happens, you know. Right. And in our case... It did in the form of uh, my wife and I were asked by a much to Bye, do. Jim. Be safe, man. Oh, see you, Jim. Nice you to meet you, Chad. Out. Love see you, man. Um, we did a. Uh, we were asked to do a uh, a series of like uh, ninety second pieces of music for the Japanese television market. Yeah, and it, they were all original compositions, and with no particular direction other than just think about that, you know, think about Japanese television, think about the culture, think about in right toward, you know, that. So we did. And that's how it started. And then one thing led to another. And then Amatsu and I got together and decided to write uh, organically with no, uh, with absolutely no, uh, agenda attached to it other than we want to we want to produce the music organically stay off the laptop as much as possible and samples and all that and just let's make these sounds up with inanimate objects like tapping a glass or mm-hmm. 
you know, running your finger up the, the strings of the piano, whatever, you know, banging on the piano, whatever it was. And so we did, and we ended up with about 12 pieces of music that are pretty hard. And uh, we're on, I'm now kind of like, that was about a year's worth of work, putting those 12 pieces together. Wow. And, uh, and we're really starting to get some attention from it. So, well, that's the thing. I mean, it's like, you, you, so are you like a, um, a guitar strummer or a keyboard plucker or? Guitar, a little bit, not a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Just enough to get in trouble, you know? That's nice. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I tried. You know, I mean, it's like, you know, I went to went to music school, so I'm an overeducated rock drummer, but it's like I got little fat fingers. Like, the guitar didn't seem like it was – so I'll, you know, pluck things out. And when I was writing songs, I had a publishing deal for a little bit. I would come with a title or kind of like a storyline or like a hook. And then when you get in the room and the way Nashvilleians, right, you know, you at least got – three people in the room usually one guy's like a great singer who's great at pro tools one's a great guitar player and then you got the drummer who comes with the you know we have such a big picture we make great producers because we see the the big picture and mm -hmm. it all and by the end of a couple hours we we'd have a a piece of music and then when i tell the kids i was like you can have this great skill set but then it just becomes a bunch of ones and zeros in a hard drive so you have to have the relationship with either the publishers or the managers or the music supervisors. Like you've got to get that music heard. Yeah, that's exactly which is, right. Which is relationships again. Totally. Totally. Yeah. It, and, and, and so from the way Los Angeles looks to me is obviously very differently than the way I looked at Los Angeles when I first began commuting out there, yeah. you know, when it was still a big rhythm section town and there was still a lot of session work to do out there. There still is, but uh, film and television primarily is the, the, the bread and butter. But then there's also the project studio that everybody has to have out there. Right. And there's tons of remote work. And that was what we built our studio to uh, provide. It, it was, uh, was remote work for our clients, both for Wendy and myself. And uh, that's, you know, of course, the fire took our home and the studio and everything oh. to our names away. And so our, our journey as a newly married couple was to, was to come back out of these ashes and put all of this back together and then resume a career just prior to COVID, it's been, it's been unbelievable, Rich. It's, you know, it's been an, a crazy journey. So between you know? the fires a couple of years ago in Los Angeles yeah. and, then the, and mm -hmm. then COVID, you were talking about these kind of like seasons of life and finding destiny and you know, yeah. thick skin. I mean, it's obviously you have thick skin and you can persevere because you've done it time and time again in the music business. And I didn't even know if you really wanted to talk about that, you know. No, I don't mind talking about it at all. It's, it's yeah. uh, I mean, you know, it was, uh, it was just one of those incredible days, you know, I was actually in Memphis recording oh. and uh, I was doing a session and uh, uh, I got a call from Wendy in early afternoon or might've even been late morning. And she just said, you know, there are fires going on out here and we're, you know, they're saying it's not going to impact us, but, you know, I'm, I'm getting scared and we're, I'm keeping a really close eye out and listening to what everybody's saying. I'll keep you posted and I'm going to please do. And that was about all I, I gave any thought to, you know, it was like, I, I wasn't terribly worried about it. Then she called back in the middle of the afternoon and she just said, now the fire's in Box Canyon, which is over kind of just a bit west of, uh, or sorry, a bit east of, of like Woodland Hills, you know? I'm thinking, that's not good. That's starting to get closer, you know? I don't like that, you know? Keep me posted. I'll keep you posted. Long story short, later that night, uh, the, uh, the evacuation was suggested she started noticing prior to the evacu the mandatory evacuation, she started noticing 
that there were people that were loading their horses up in their horse trailers to get their animals out of there. And yeah. she said, saw that, that's it. We're out of here. So she grabbed, she just said, what do you have to have uh, just in case a fire does come? What do you want me to grab of yours? While and I said, okay, grab this guitar, that guitar, that snare drum. Don't worry about cases. Don't worry about any of that shit. Just grab that stuff, throw it in my car. My car is the biggest of the two. Put everything in my car and you guys get out of there. Oh, you know? I'm so and, sorry. It, it, yeah. Because, I mean, can you, I mean, obviously, I don't know what the California law is as far as like earthquakes and fires. I mean, it's, they're so common. Is, is it, mm -hmm. can you, can you insure against those things? Or, I mean, but even well, still, you're, you're losing precious things. Well, earthquake, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, we had fire insurance. I mean, we, you know, we, we had a, you know, our, our, our homeowner's policy, but as almost everyone will tell you, what an insurance company will sell you is underinsured because they don't want you to think that you can't afford their product. Right. So the best way to write it is to underwrite you, mm -hmm. right? Like while they're underwriting you, they're underwriting you, if that makes any sense. Yeah, you know? yeah. And, and so we were underinsured. Mm -hmm. So the fire, if, had the fire been a natural, occur, like a lightning strike or something like that, we would have been, oh, I don't know what would have happened to us. I really don't. I, I'm not sure. That would have put us in a tough spot. We just couldn't have afforded to rebuild. So because of the fact that the uh, Addison, the utility company, is guilty of starting the fire, or uh, guilty of causing it, I should say. Oh, really? Wow. It, we, we're in a lawsuit that will compensate for what our losses were. Okay, but that's a lawsuit that is still not yet settled. So we're we're moving forward, completing this this home, but we're we don't have enough money to finish it. Right. So we're going to have to borrow money to finish the house, and then the process of building the house and the studio back has just been unbelievably expensive. Right. Because because of all the new codes, the seismic codes, uh, the uh, uh, everything, just everything associated with building the house back mm. is so much more expensive. Our, our budget, our building budget doubled from the time we started construction. Mm. You know? Well, it's, 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 that's the thing, is that it's such a magical place that I've always mm -hmm. been attracted to. It's one of these yeah. energy points in the world. And it's like right. it's the most desirable uh, atmosphere as far as like the blue sky, sunny and 70. I mean, you don't yeah. even really need a weather person. It's like, what a strange job. Of course, it's going to be sunny and 70 again. But those yeah. Santa Ana winds, man, they are fierce. It is, and it's something you, it's, you have to every year. It's like windy season. Yep. And, and, it's, and it's for us. When those uh, start to blow, for us, that's that's PTSD for us. Particularly, oh. it's really hard on her. She's really, really, really frightened of it. My ha my farm here in Tennessee was hit by a tornado in 2008. So I've been through a natural disaster before, and I've got a little bit of conditioning from that. I went through the PTSD fear thing associated with that, uh, but nothing could have prepared me for how horrible a fire is. There's, there's yeah. nothing, nothing like. And I'm so and, sorry, man. Yeah, well, I appreciate that. But you know, the the good news is, is we're coming out of it, and uh, it has tested my my uh, to you know, it has just tested. Our, our marriage, it's tested our professions, it's tested every conceivable, whatever our spiritual strength is derived from, it has tested that, you know, it's been a real challenge uh, uh, 
about what it takes to live, you know? Like, yeah. how, bad, how bad do you really want this, whatever this is? And for us, this is we want our home back. This is we want our ability to do our work again in our studio. We want that back. The things we lost that can't be replaced, they're gone. You know, our, our heirlooms, our family things, those oh. things are, there's nothing we can do about that. But it, that has taught me the greatest lesson of all, which is, is there's no problem with travel and light, you know? There really isn't. Right. I don't need 30 drum sets, you know? I'll just let me have two or three or whatever, you know? Whatever it is I need to do my job is all I really need. Yeah. And yeah, that's man. just teaches you, you know? And uh, it's I've learned a lot about patience, you know, getting building permits in L.A. County will test a man and a woman. Oh, woo, buddy, that's that's tough as it gets. Yeah, and it's like it's like getting that, uh, you know, beer or liquor license for a restaurant tour. It's yeah, very difficult, very difficult. And, and that's, you know, just that's we're going we're going. We've, well, we made it through that. We've, we're seventy percent of the way on the construction. We really are seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, which is the blessing in it all. And when it's over with, we're going to have a safe home to live in, you know. And uh, grateful for that. I'm I'm grateful for that, and I'm grateful for whatever the future brings us. You know. Yeah, man. Well, I mean, we keep surviving somehow. You know. Yeah. We not only survive, but we thrive with our given circumstances. And I think it's the gratitude and the humility, um, you know, combined with a work ethic. I mean, it's like, you know, mm-hmm. I, I, I'm, there's, I'm going to meet a drummer probably today and tomorrow that are better than me, but I'm going to show up first and I'm going to be the last one to leave and I'm going to be super happy to be there and yeah. I'm just going to keep showing up. You know? that's, that's it. That's 90% of it, you know. For sure. The ability to play, obviously, you got to have that, but – but I, the, the greater challenge and the greater importance, I think, falls on the way that we interact with our, the folks we're doing these records with and, and doing tours with, you know. It's, it is a family, you know. Yeah, it, yeah I family. can't wait to see my guys. I mean, literally, we just, I don't want to call it a celebration, but we marked, um, yesterday was one year since we canceled our Live Nation show and I jumped on a plane out to here uh, to, mm-hmm. to Los Angeles because our show was canceled. And I went from seeing my girlfriend in a bi-coastal relationship twice a month to seeing each other 24 hours a day, seven days a week for 365 days. And we yeah. grew as a couple. Oh, sure you did. Yeah. yeah. It was Those fun. Things you a lot about, about, you know, is this the one? Is this the, is she really the one? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. The answer is yeah. Yeah, you I mean, know? if you can if you can survive what you guys have been through, and you can survive COVID together. I mean, because it's been very uh, taxing, I think, on a lot of relationships, whether they're new or you know very established. Yeah, yeah, very difficult. Yeah, yeah, yeah. man. I, and I don't even know how we would follow up that with. Um, so you like diecast hoops because that's not really you know the, <laughs> this pod this podcast. But I will tell everyone you sent me the link. Rolling Stone has been doing this amazing thing where uh, where they do a spotlight. I guess it's called Unknown Legends, which is kind of yeah. makes me laugh a little bit. And Andy Green did a great piece on you. It's kind of like a career retrospective. Nice interview, and there's tons of video footage with you with mostly long hair. There was one little period where you had a, like a little short haircut with Frampton. Yeah, uh-huh. I, I had that a little bit with Knopfler really early on too, around the same yeah. time. Yeah, yeah. I cut. I, mean, I don't know why I did that, but I just. I, I don't know. I guess I just felt like I needed to cut all my hair off and see what that looked like for a minute. Well, here's what I do want to talk about. I want to tell you. Yeah, tell me. Slightly new, uh, for me anyway. And that is is, is I have uh, been employed by Craviato Drums. Oh, wow. To, to run their A&R department. That's fantastic. You're consulting. And, um, I, I'm... I'm a drum guy now. Yeah. On the other side of the glass. That's cool. So, so I am absolutely stoked about that. 
And I'm really, really excited about a new drum line that they're coming with. Uh, it's called the Diamond Series. It's applied shell, Sam Bacco. It's his baby. Oh, really? And Sam is actually running Craviato Drums now. I did There's not the, know that. Yeah, and he's the only guy that I'm aware of in the, in the United States that would be qualified to do that. And, uh, and he's doing such a great job. The entire operation is here in Nashville now. Great, because you, so, you were friends with Johnny. I was very good friends with Johnny. Johnny came to Neil Young's ranch in 88, and I was working on a Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young album. And he showed up in his pickup truck with the first four uh, drums that he ever made uh, from the what was called what became called solid. I don't know if you ever played any of those. Yeah, snares. Greg Morrow's always telling me about solid snares. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and so I I got to see the very first four that he made, and Johnny and I were friends from then on. We always remained friends, and uh, I left Drum Workshop uh, to to play for Johnny, and uh, that was a heartbreaking breakup, but. Is the right thing for me to do creatively at the time, and you know, probably not the best business decision I ever made, but it was absolutely the best creative one I made. And so I've got, I've always had this kind of love brotherhood thing with Johnny. As as wacky a guy as he was, he was the a consummate drum maker, and uh, I've just always been in love with those drums. So I'm happily back with those guys and playing the drum set again. And oh wow! So uh, okay, so you left Pearl now to go back to. I went back. Well, the reason I went back is because they offered me a position that I I just couldn't say no to. Sure. I didn't see how, you know, I've never had a problem with with Craviato drums at all. I had a problem with the fact that Johnny died. Right. Right. You know, that was sure. like I just didn't know how to go on with that yeah, yeah. so that that sort of signaled some sort of a change for me and i didn't do anything straight away but w I, I tried to do a thing with pearl which was great it was absolutely great and uh they've got some lovely new gear out there you know yeah. it's really terrific and i was proud to to do some promoting for them uh but then this offer came it was like the first person i called was the uh, uh, head of A&R, John, over at, uh, at Pearl, and said, John, I have to tell you, this is what's going on. And he was really sweet, and he just said, hey, you can't not do that. You got to go. Yeah. And I said, I think I got to go, man. So, so now are you going to start, like, um, targeting, like, players in Nashville, like, or a variety of idioms to make sure that you stock the pond across, yeah. like, the metal yeah. guys? and yes. Yeah, I mean, I'm in the process, the very, very early stages of all of that. That's cool. And I don't want, it can't just be about Nashville guys. You know, this is, I, I really don't, that, that wouldn't be right. You know, so there's a, there's a thing with those, the jazz guys really love Johnny's stuff, you know. But then there's also a, a bunch of cats out there that aren't necessarily jazz guys that love Johnny's stuff. The problem with Johnny's stuff, if there is one, is that the, the custom kits are really expensive. And so that cuts a pretty wide swath of guys that are just not going to go there. They're not going to, they're not going to spend that kind of money yeah. to do it. And, I, and I remember being out there with uh, with Chris McHugh on the Keith Urban tour, and we were opening up, and he's like, come sit up here and play these drums. And he's like, those are $12,000. I'm like, holy cow, man. Yeah, yeah, they're yeah. really, really expensive. And and that's that's just not practical for most professional drummers. It's just not in the cards, you know. So what they've done very wisely is Sam conceptualized – uh, this new plied shell that is just fantastic. So 
that's going to make it a lot easier for the young cats to jump in, Great. at least get in the water and start somewhere. And then they can build out from that, you know? So I feel like I, I you know, I'm, I'm excited about getting as long as I've been doing this, I feel excited about the idea that I can go travel around the country and go look for some young guys, man, that are, that are bringing it and need a home or want a home that spiritually lines up with what the Craviato Drum Company is all about and what it aspires to be from, from here forward, you know? Yeah. And the fact that it's Nashville based now makes me really proud for Nashville and Craviato. You know, it's a, it's a really cool thing. That's great, so, man. Yeah, and you have all the knowledge and experience to pull from. I, I feel like the best A&R guys are the ones that are real musicians that have a playing history that can understand the psychology of what yeah. a touring drummer is going to need because, you know, a lot of, like, high-end gourmet drums, the only prop sometimes the problem is, well, like, if I'm in Peoria or Fargo, can I get this piece of hardware that I need tomorrow? And yeah. the answer is many times no. Um, right. So, so – you know, that's sometimes the only challenge. Um, but it sounds like you're going to crush it, man. Well, we're steaming toward having solutions for, for covering things like that. Are we ever going to have the degree of backline coverage that, like, Pearl would have? No. I mean, that's – we're talking – I don't even know how many – backline kits in the world are sitting there waiting for a pearl artist or a dr or drum workshop for that matter you know yeah these guys are the big fish in the pond you know and they're and and so be it that's beautiful but in all of the you know primary markets and secondary markets uh we're going to cover that we're going to get to to that that place where we yeah. will be able to and, uh, and what, what a lot of folks don't know is that these these big companies um, have to provide the sound checks and the SIRs and the all these backline companies with with these drums because the artists are going to come in, they're going to request these drums, they're going to do this grassroots marketing on the Tonight Shows and the Today Shows and the Good Morning Americas, and that's expensive right. for a company to provide drums to all those different vendors. Very expensive, yeah, yeah, that's right. But, uh, you know, Craviato for a long time just couldn't do that. There weren't, there, they, couldn't, they couldn't produce that much product to even cover the backline needs. So now there's a, there's a plan in place to, to be able to do that. And not only that, but to be able to put amazing drum sets in there that uh, anybody would be thrilled to get behind and play. Oh, yeah, man. I'd love to hear it. So um, yeah. what about the... Um What's the, it sounds like you're in a, in a great spot in the sense that you have a, 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 once you get through this, you have a beautiful new home waiting on you. You're living in two cities. You got this cool brand new job. You're composing mm -hmm. now, and this is like a, yeah. a cool thing that's going to bring you into your next 20 years. I feel like mm -hmm. you're in a great spot in your life, man, in a great season. I am. I'm, I'm in a really good place. And, and uh, you know, once the, the COVID cloud lifts and we can all get back on the tour bus and get back at it you know i'm really excited about getting to do that again obviously and and uh, i'm excited about about you know all the opportunities that are ahead you know I've, I've, all kinds of stuff is brewing right now and i think it's really ironic that it's happening at this stage of my life you know i would have i would have thought by now that as long as I've been doing it, the sun might be setting a bit, you know, and that is just not the case. It's the, the sun's only going to set if I decide it's time for the sun to set. But that's not where I'm at, you know. Yeah. No, you're not just, the retiring type. It's no, you know. oh man, no, they'll, you know, they'll find me, you know. I don't know where they'll find me, <laughs> but no, it'll I'm be. Gonna, I'll die with the sticks in my hand for sure. Yeah, 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 absolutely. I'm a lifer. I don't want to stop this. It's, this is my hobby. It's not, yeah. it's not, yeah, it's my hobby. So well, it was definitely a calling for you because, like I said, you have that it factor and the fact that you're 
self-taught and it i think that's proof that playing along with records is an amazing training because that's probably how you started and it, is. it got that groove that r&b soul rock and roll groove into your dna oh yeah yeah it it did it was i mean you know the the, the first time i worked with joe uh uh, a really, really influential record for me was uh, a record called Barnstorm, which was a pet band of Joe's called Barnstorms, Joe Vitale and Kenny Passarelli and, and Joe. And they made this amazing record. And I sat with my record player right to my left and these crappy old headphones. And I must have played along to that record 10 million times and I would have never dreamed that I would end up playing for Joe you know and then a little further down the line circling back to Joe Bob I would have never dreamed I'd be in a band with him yeah you know and so and, and I, I've told Joe Bob that a million times like man you're drumming on this record it was a big deal to me you know yeah. and we talk about it, you know, occasionally. And, and uh, so it's like whatever your training is, as long as it's, it, you know, like if it's self-taught, then only you're just going to gravitate to what you're moved by. You know, that's what you're going to play to. It could have just as easily been a Miles Davis record, you know. Yeah, kind, kind of blues, and, everybody's first jazz record. Yeah, you know, and it's, it's like I didn't know which way that was going to go. Yeah. It just sort of presented itself you know so kenny's got a book liberty's got a book joe bob's got a book is there a book yeah. in you man eventually All right. yeah i mean you know i'm hearing that question more and more these days uh god knows i've got stories you know i've got a few yeah maybe i'll tell maybe i'll uh sit down with somebody and, and, and do that sometime. Yeah. I, I, I think that my kids would enjoy that, you know, and, and uh, as something to, you know, to. Yeah. And I forgot about Carmine. It's like, yeah, it's like, it's, the, it's all timing. The world will tell you when it's time to do it. I mean, I, yeah. I don't think you should write a memoir before 60. I feel like 60 is like a, like you like you have a perspective. I don't know. It just seems like a magic number. Yep. Well, I have I, I, my arc has definitely crossed the sixty line. Yeah, so, man. Well, hey, I, I I turned fifty, and I'm and I'm and I don't know where, what you were doing at at that age, but there's something. It's like this, just a slight panic. Like, oh my god, I've achieved a lot of my childhood dreams. My parents are happy. I got a roof over my head. How long am I going to be here? Uh, Twenty years? Thirty years? Whoa. What's the plan? Am I going to be okay? Just like a little bit of anxiety, fear, panic about like being, you know, getting the black balloons at the party, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I hear you, man. I'm just thinking about what you just said. Uh, so 50. Okay, that's for me, that's 13 years ago. So I would have been, I would, I would have just started a long run of work that began when I left Knopfler and, and then subsequently started with Neil again. Uh, it was around that time. And that began about a four and a half year run uh, with Neil. Two world tours, two, three, two or three records, you know, and it was just like a blur, yeah. you know. But yeah. yeah I would have been, and I was doing the same thing because I was in a, I was actually on a hiatus from touring. I, I, I didn't want to, I was feeling that thing where, you know, I think I'm through touring. I'm not sure I'm going to do this anymore. And I really felt that in my bones. I thought, man, I don't know. You know, a few years of that. And I suddenly realized, I'm no, I'm not done with touring. I miss it. Yep. Yeah, I miss it. It's got to be both. I can't do one without the other. For sure. It's a great model. Hey, I wore this for you, man. Oh, good man. You, 
That's a good T-shirt right it's there. It's a Stacks Records fo- uh, shirt. <laughs> that's how. I got that's how I learned right there. Those guys, the founder of Stacks, yep. and his partner were who taught me how to do sessions. Amazing. Yeah, that was that was a that was a great early education to get. It. I mean, we all learn in our own ways. I learned on bandstands, uh, but I also learned, you know, academically when I'm when you're in college and you got a ten page chart. And you got to figure out how you're going to play spang spang a lang at warp speed, hit all the figures, play the dynamics, and then turn the page. It's yeah. like, you know what I mean? But now I'm going back and I'm playing along with these records, uh, yeah. Stacks, Motown, rediscovering these things. Um, sure. All the Friday night, who's the guy? Uh, the Friday night fish fry guy. Um, he was like an early rock and roller guy. And we're losing so many, like, God, wait, little Richard and fats it's just the piece of history is just disappearing man i got to do a session with little richard <coughs> gosh it's probably at least 10 years ago at yeah. least that. and uh, I, uh it's actually a cute little story uh, I, re- I was so blown away that i was in the studio with him and uh, he he came to the session but he didn't want to play and uh, he was reluctant to do that. And so he stayed in the control room and we're out on the floor. He wanted another keyboard player there to cover him, you know, his bit. And so Reese Winan was, Reese Winans was there. And so we're, we're, we're working this track up and, uh, and little Richard keeps getting on the talk back and he keeps telling Reese, you know, Hey, well, look, on this session right here, Maybe try this. Well, and then, no, nah, no, nah, I'll try this right. And this went on for a little while. And finally, I think Reese might have been the first person to say it. He goes, can't you just, why don't you come out here and play me what you're hearing? So he Which, wanted to sing, but he didn't want to play. No, he, he didn't even want, he wanted to just be there. And then he would do his singing and stuff after the fact, okay. right? So he finally, Reese cleverly got him to come out to the piano. And, of course, when Little Richard got to the piano, now Little Richard's playing piano. Yeah. So, anyway, I got it in my head. It's like, I've got to see if he'll sign my snare drum, you know? And so I went to him. Oh, no, I went to his handler guy and i said is there any possibility that little richard would sign my snare autograph and snare drum and he said he didn't do he didn't do stuff like that and i said oh wow okay all right well i'm really sorry i just i'm a huge fan and it would just mean the world if he was willing to do that and he goes well let's see you know let's let's wait till we get the song and, and you know if everything's cool i'll mention it to him but i can't guarantee it <laughs> End of, you know, so I just thought, nah, he's not going to sign this thing. And we finished, we got the track. Everything's good. Everybody's happy, you know. And the guy comes over to me and he goes, I just want to let you know that Rich is going to sign this, but, uh, but uh, he needs to speak with you personally before he signs this drum. And I went, whoa, okay. So session's over with, and I go and sit down with him, and he and he and he's looking. He looks me dead in the eye, and he just goes, "There's some things I, I need to before I sign your drum. I'd like to share with you." And I went, "Okay," and he gave me his personal testimonial as a Christian that was important to him to share with me. And just purely as a like a like a preacher, you know, he wanted to talk right. to me about God, you know, and he's so he so he he finished his thing, and then he handed me this little tiny Bible about this big. He put that in my hand, and he goes, "Now I'll sign your snare drum." Ah, uh, he just has and a so, he he just wants to touch a certain number of people every day spiritually, yeah. probably. Yep, he's yeah. all about. He was all about that, you know. Well, he's up there entertaining the angels, man. I he's doing. What. He's 
Talk about eighth notes. <laughs> yeah, he's probably telling them all about what wop a loop a wop a boom means. <laughs> he's showing oh, them. Hey, that Friday Night Fish Fry was Louis Jordan. That came oh, to me. right. Yes. Oh, my yeah. God. Mm -hmm. Man. Well, this was so great to spend time with you, man. I know drummers, you know, we close joints down. Um, but uh, it was so nice to spend this time with you. After being in Nashville almost 25 years, I never got to talk to you for this length of time, so I really appreciate it. Well, man, it's a pleasure, and I really appreciate you thinking of me. And uh, Let's not let this go by too much longer before we do it again. No, let's do it, man. I'm pulling for you and with the house, and maybe we'll have that. Uh, we'll have a nice cold martini in Calabasas. Be great. Oh, I'll, I'll, let me tell you right where that's going to be. There's a restaurant on PCH in Trancas called Christie's. It's the best martini in Los Angeles. Okay, this is going on the top of my to-do list. Yeah. As soon as I get my second vaccine and the world starts coming to life, we will do it. Count on that, my friend. Count on it. Awesome, man. Thank you so much for your time, brother. You are welcome, Rich. Be safe and be well, pal. Absolutely. And hey, to all the listeners out there, I got an email address for you, the Rich Redmond Show at gmail.com. And as always, be sure to subscribe, share, rate, and review. It helps people find the podcast. Really appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Keep coming back for the good stuff. We'll see you next time. Thanks, Chad. You're welcome, Rich. See you soon, buddy. This has been the Rich Redmond Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredmond.com forward slash podcasts.